Let's move on to etiology and treatment, the old nature versus nurture debate. Genetic studies tell us that monozygotic twins have a 50 to 70% rate of concordance, whereas dizygotic twins have a 10 to 25% concordance rate. That works out to be roughly 4 to 1 ratio in terms of genetic weight. First degree relatives of a person with major depression have a 2 to 3 fold increased risk of depression. On the nurture side of things, I like to use the analogy of a bridge. As an aside, you might recognize the Aurora Bridge there in Seattle. It had the second highest suicide rate for a bridge after the Golden Gate in San Francisco until they put up new fences on it. The fact that a mere fence diminished the suicide rate on this bridge so dramatically illustrates the seriousness of low energy and motivation associated with depression. Back to the analogy. The bridge represents a combination of a few things. For one, it represents one's genetics. As above, some people have genetic loading for depression. This can be augmented by resilience and also coping strategies that can reinforce the tolerance of one's bridge. If you think of cars going across the bridge as stressors, you can see how the more cars you have on the bridge, the more likely it is to break. This is one view of how stress relates to biology and could account for why one monozygotic twin might not get depressed essentially less stress to break the bridge. Cortisol has long been considered the stress hormone. You can see its role in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which led to later studies. There are a couple of ways that depression has been looked at throughout time. One investigation that came out of the noted effects of stress on the HPA axis is the dexamethasone suppression test. There is a physiologic bimodal spike in cortisol in individuals. When you administer dexamethasone to a normal individual, there should be a subsequent suppression in cortisol as a result of the feedback loop. In 70% of depressed individuals, there is an abnormality in this normal physiologic response. With the advent of neuroimaging, people have been looking for a spot in the brain to attribute to depression. The subgenual prefrontal cortex has popped up in a number of studies as one possible contributor. Back to the HPA axis. Over time, the adrenal and thyroid have been eliminated as options through various studies. That leaves the hypothalamus. In addition, growth hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone are noted to be low in many individuals with depression and with the dexamethasone suppression test. The important thing to remember here is that these are catecholamine regulated. We will come back to this. On the imaging side of things, animal studies were done where lesions to the subgenual prefrontal cortex were induced. These animals were noted to have no ability to extinguish fear. In humans with lesions in the, to this area, these individuals were found to have poor ability to evaluate the social consequences that results in increased self-criticism and rumination. Two highly common symptoms of depression and anxiety. So stepping back, you can see how all these various components are related, but we are still very far from figuring out the whole picture. If we take a quick history lesson in treatment, this can also give us some insight as to other possible etiologic factors. In the 1950s, there were these guys on Staten Island who were giving out isoniazid for or the equivalent in those days for the treatment of tuberculosis. And they started noticing that many of the depressed patients were getting better on these meds. Isoniazid is a really weak monoamine oxidase inhibitor, but when they tried a strong MAOI, the effects were even better. Also in the 50s, but a bit later, surgeons were having problems with what they called surgical shock. In hopes of finding a better antihistamine, tricyclics were tested likely also for their sedating effects. You can see how the TCA blocks reuptake of serotonin and noradrenaline in the synaptic cleft, while MAOIs can inhibit mitochondrial breakdown of precursors to neurotransmitters in the presynaptic cleft, as well as reuptake in the cleft, where TCA is not already there. All these meds were slowly studied over time. It was found that they had one main effect, increased norepinephrine in the synaptic cleft, and to a lesser degree, increased serotonin. The problem was that TCAs and MAOIs had such terrible and intolerable side effects that few patients would take them. 
So roughly knowing the effects of these meds, they set out to create a medication that had pure serotonergic effects. Thus, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor was born. Like the name implies, it blocks only the reuptake of serotonin in the synaptic cleft, and thus there are significantly diminished side effects and mildly improved outcomes, which are probably mostly due to compliance and safety more than effectiveness. So since SSRIs were created, there has been numerous theories on serotonin's role in depression, which brings us back to some of the previous discussion of catecholamine regulation and how these things are all connected through stress, hormones, and neurotransmitters, ultimately originating from our genetics, but clearly not the whole picture. Now let's talk more specifically about medication treatment and highlight just a few major points. There are four main classes of antidepressants listed here, except SNRIs, which we can discuss briefly in class. As we discovered earlier, they are all generally efficacious, but SSRIs are so much more tolerable and safe that they have become the first-line treatment for medications. TZAs are extremely lethal in overdose, and given that so many people with depression have suicidality, TCAs are a risky choice. MAOIs are excellent medications, but are a pain, mostly due to the dietary restrictions and, again, are not as safe as the SSRIs. Remember that roughly 50% of people respond to antidepressants, which does not mean a cure, but rather an improvement. Here are the most common side effects of each of these classes. For SSRIs, the GI and headaches usually go away or lessen after patients get used to the med in the first few weeks. There is a lot of serotonin in the gut. If a patient has sexual side effects, we will often switch the medication to bupropion or Wellbutrin, which is supposed to have less sexual side effects. You can summarize a lot of the TCA side effects as anticholinergic effects, and the others are noted here. Recall the mnemonic, hot as a hair, dry as a bone, blind as a bat, red as a beet, mad as a hatter, to remember the anticholinergic side effects. MAOI food restrictions include anything that has a lot of tyramine in it or has been sitting around long enough for tyramine to build up. If you remember back to biochem and the Krebs cycle, you can see how an MAOI can cause tyramine to build up by blocking its first pass metabolism through the liver. So patients on MAOIs can have a hypertensive crisis if they eat aged cheese, beer, wine, cured meats, or liver. Each person has a different tolerance of tyramine and it's hard to predict, so the general guidelines is to avoid these foods altogether. Because the selective MAOIs are now more potent when in combination with SSRIs, they have a high rate of serotonin syndrome, which can be life-threatening and can basically be summarized as too much serotonin. Therapy has been proven to be just as effective, if not more, than medications. And when therapy and meds are combined, there is a synergistic effect. There are more philosophical differences between the therapies than anything else, but if you are asked about therapy in a test question, the answer is almost always cognitive behavioral therapy. You can think of therapy as a way of beefing up your bridge with coping mechanisms and social networks. There are healthy sublimation and unhealthy alcoholism, ways of dealing with stress. Therapy often tries to redirect people towards more healthy ways of coping. Lastly, ECT, which usually gets the response of, they still do that, is actually a very effective, safe, and frequently used treatment. The exact mechanism of how it works is still not fully understood, but essentially, electricity is sent through the brain to induce a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. It is a recommended treatment, especially in refractory depression, severe depression with suicidality, and catatonia.